Bible says this in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse uh, 54. It says, having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of a courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was, with, was also with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I don't know him. And a little after, or after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and then Peter remembered the words of the Lord and how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. The title of today's message, Peter's Process. Let's pray together. Father God, I ask right now that in this moment, Lord, you would hide me behind the cross. Father, it would be your words and not my words spoken. God, that you would use me. And Father, that we would hear what it is you want us to hear today. And Lord, we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Go ahead and welcome your neighbor as you're taking a seat. Welcome your neighbor. Tell somebody hello. Tell somebody welcome to Village Church. Hey, and if you're watching online, I want to welcome you. We have a lot of people that watch online. Welcome to Village Church Online. Uh, if it's your first time here, too, I want to welcome you, man. You could be anywhere else, but you chose to be here. I'm so thankful for that. My name is John Michael Gibson. I get the honor to be one of the pastors here at this church. Uh, I'm so thankful for, to be able to lead such an incredible uh, group of people and, and just an amazing church, man. Village Church is something else, is it not? Come on, somebody. It's a good church. I, I'm not just saying it because... I, I'm not just saying it because I'm the pastor here. I'm just saying it because this is a good church, man. I know pastors that tell me their church ain't good. I'm just saying. So y'all are a good church. I'm thankful. And I'm glad that, that if you're a first-time guest, I'm so thankful that you're here. We've been in this series. We started last week, uh, and, and I titled it Journey to the Cross. And over the next several weeks, we're going to be taking a journey to the cross. Um, and last week, we talked about the betrayal of G Judas. Um, this week, we're going to talk about Peter's denial of, of Jesus, but we're actually going to have five sermons in this series. You say, how are we going to have five sermons in a four-week period? Well, good news is this year we are doing a Good Friday service. Come on, somebody. That means right here on Friday the 29th of March at 7.30 p.m., we are having our Good Friday service, and we are going to talk about the crucifixion, and then we're going to do a totally separate message that Sunday morning. So you don't want to miss either one of them. We're going to take communion that Friday night as well. So this is the time for family. We're actually shutting the kids' department down. We're going to bring the kids in with us. We're going to have a family time. I think there's nothing more important. And let me hear me out. I'm ADHD, so I don't have them in here 51 out of the 52 weeks of the year, okay? Or, yeah, yeah. But one week, we'll have them in here because here's what I do believe. I believe there's nothing more important than a child watching their parent take communion and worship the Lord. Amen? And so that night, we're going to have them in here. But be prepared for that. That's going to be on the 29th, and uh, I'm excited about that message. I'm excited about what God's doing in this series. But we've been taking this journey to the cross and following Jesus' footsteps. And last week, if you remember, we were in the upper room where Judas had ended up going out and betraying Jesus. He actually turned Jesus over to the temple guards to be arrested, and, and there was a reason behind the, him doing that. And we talked about last week. I encourage you to go back, watch that if you missed it. But this week we're going to talk about Peter's process. And I want us to understand something. Every single one of us in this room, we're in a process. I don't know if you realize that, but you're a part of a process. If you became a Christ follower, you immediately entered into this process called discipleship. 
and you're in a process. If you're married, then guess what? You're in a process. Men, it's the process of learning your wife. Women, it's the process of learning your husband. Now, I know for both of you, those two, those seem like two uh, trigonometry things that we're never going to learn, okay? I understand that. It's called a process, amen? Somebody say, it's a process. It's a process. So Peter... He had a process as well, but all of us are in a process. And, you know, when I got called by God to do what I was doing, and when I answered the call, I was 18 years old, and immediately I got placed on a process. Now, I wish that God just would have called me and sent me out and said, hey, son, go take over the world. But here's the problem. Without the process, we're not going to be very useful, and we're not going to necessarily get to the promise that God has for us. See, we can cut corners in the process, but you're never going to receive the fullness, hear what I said, the fullness of the promise. I'm not saying that you won't receive some promise, but if you want to receive the fullness of the promise of what God has for you, it takes a process. And the same thing happened for me. God said, hey, I'm calling you into ministry. When I accepted that call, I was 18 years old. He put me on a process. Here's the interesting thing about the process, though. When good things happen in the process... We feel good. I remember when we started this church and there were days, and I kid you not, Scott and Stacy can attest, we we started our first service, we had 50 people, we had the next service, we had 12. And it was scary. (laughs) I'm telling them to shut the kids' department down, bring the little ones in, they're like, why, it's only two. Yeah, but two out of there makes 14 in here. It just looks better. But there was a process. God had to take us through this process. And many of you, you've been a part of the process. You remember when we started over there, when we went online and then we came back to Cutler Bay Worship Center for a year. And then finally we came back here in the cafeteria and all that setting up and staring down stages, right? Like we remember the process. And when the good happens, we're all like, man, glory to God, praise God. When the bad happens, we just can't understand how that's part of the process. When the good happens, of course, God would do this. He would give us money. He would give us a spot. He would give us this. I just can't understand why this happened because there's no way this is going to be part of the process. Can I lead you to two verses real, real quick? There's two verses in the Bible I want us to read. Number one, James 1.17, it says this. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. What the Bible's saying there is that everything good that we see in this world, it has come from the Father. Anything good, whether it's a a, a technological advance in this world, that comes from God. It could be one of the most evil people that created the technological advance, but I'm telling you this, the Bible says that all wisdom and knowledge comes from God, so anything that advances us in a good way comes from God. No matter who's, who's behind it, because what? God works all things out for good, according to those who love him and follow him. So therefore, for us, we have this promise that anything good is from God. But here's another verse I want to point you to, because oftentimes we're like, well, but the bad, it can't be from God. Here's what it says. Lamentations 3.38. Does not the most high send both calamity and good? Does he not send both calamity and good? Now, let's dissect this real quick, because for some of you that are saying, I knew God did it. I knew God killed my family member. I knew God brought me cancer. I knew God did this. I knew, it's not what it says. It doesn't say God brings all calamity. It definitely said that God brings all good. Anything good, you cannot associate with the devil. That is not his doing. That's not his bidding. That's God's. But anything bad, you also can't associate with the devil and say, that's his bidding. That's his bidding. That's his bidding. bidding." No, God says here that do I not bring it on both? So I ask myself as I'm reading this story and I'm thinking about Peter and I'm thinking about his process and what he went through in this story, Peter has denied Jesus three times. Now, I have to take us back because we have to see that the calamity that's brought upon Peter's life is for a purpose. Oftentimes in the process, we can praise God for the good, but we need to recognize God in the bad. We need to recognize he might be shutting it down for a reason. He might be ending the relationship because you don't recognize that later on that you're going to end up getting a divorce. And if you got married now, he had to shut it down to protect you. See, we don't see the calamity. We just see the calamity as bad, but we don't necessarily see it as God. 
doing something, shifting something, changing something. Let's be honest, change hurts. It's not easy, but it's necessary. And see, in this story, what we've read, we see that Peter, if you remember last week, we, we, we mentioned them being in the upper room. Peter's in the upper room with Jesus and the other disciples. Judas has already left. Jesus looks at him. He says, my spirit stirred. He's like, look, one of you are going to, or excuse me, he said, all of you are going to abandon me. You're going to go different ways. You're going to be scattered about. And here's Peter being bold Peter. He's a little bit eager. He's a little bit impulsive. That's his personality, right? So here's Peter. He's like, Lord, I will never. It doesn't matter if all of them, every one of them can run from you. But Lord, here's my, I'm not, I'm ready to die for you. Then Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, by the the time the rooster crows, you will have denied me two times or three times. The rooster will crow twice. You will have denied me three times by the end of this night. Now think about Peter. He's standing there saying, Lord, I'm ready to die for you. You know what Jesus is saying? You ain't ready. You ain't ready. That's why there's a process. Oftentimes, we try to skip the process and get to the place of death and say, Lord, I'm ready to die for you. He says, you're not ready for that yet. But you know what's amazing? And after the story that we read today, you'll see this. And if you come back next month, we're going to actually talk about this. But Jesus, in John chapter 21, he grants Peter his very wish. He says, Peter, you will die for me now. You know why? Because you're ready. Right now, he's like, Peter, you're not ready. You're You're going to deny me, bro. You think you got it figured out? You don't know what's about to take place. Jesus saying, I do. So then they're in the garden of Gethsemane and all of a sudden Judas shows up and and we talked about this. He comes up and he gives him a kiss on the cheek to represent, this is the man, this is the guy you're supposed to arrest. And Peter, being as bold as he is, he already told Jesus, I'm ready to go to war. I'm ready to die. So the Bible actually teaches us that when they're in the garden, Peter pulls out a sword and lops the ear off of one of the servants. You're like, that's in there? It is. You should read it. And check this out. Imagine you're, you're the guy you're following, your Messiah. You chop the ear off and you're like, Jesus, look what I did. Yes. You know what Jesus did? He healed the man. He went and picked up the ear, put it back on the servant's head. I don't know how it worked. Just imagine you put it up there and choo It's healed. Now, Peter's got to be confused. Peter's like, but I thought, hold on. Like, Jesus, that was your chance. <laughs> like, I just chopped the ear off. I thought everybody was jumping in. Like, could you, you ever been in that situation? You go diving in and you look back and ain't nobody following you? <laughs> That's what I imagine Peter. He's like, oh, okay, here it comes, here it comes. Come on, come on. And all of a sudden he's looking around. He's like, we ready? We ready? Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Yeah, shoot. Wait, where y'all at? Hold on. Jesus, this was your chance. And what does he do? He heals the man. He does the exact opposite of what Peter thought it was time to do. You know, sometimes we could try to push our God, or excuse me, our agenda onto our God and assume that this is the right way. And then when it doesn't happen, we end up like Peter. We end up very, very confused. But God, I thought this relationship was for me. But God, we've been together for three and a half years. Why would you make us break up now? I thought this was, I thought this was it. He says, but are you sure you didn't force it the last two and a half years? But God, I thought this job was it. Why are you telling me to quit it? I'm finally making money. I'm finally doing this. I'm finally doing that. I, don't, I, don't, I thought this was it. He says, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but did I give you that job or did you go fight through it and push down windows and push down doors to get it just for the money or did you do it for me? See, a lot of times we, 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 we are going in a direction and then God all of a sudden stops us and says, hey, your heart's right, but your actions are wrong. You're going in the wrong way. Peter's heart was right. His action was wrong. So then all of a sudden we pick up in the story where we were, where Peter and, and, uh, and, and the disciple John, if you read the book of John, it talks about them walking together. But Peter's following them as they're taking Jesus. They've arrested Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. He just healed this man's ear. They're taking him back to the temple palace where he's going to be judged. He's going to be put in front of the high priest. And the Bible says that Peter followed behind from a distance. Can I just tell you something? You know, you can't follow Jesus from a distance. Either you're with him 
or you're not. There's no middle ground. There's no, I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'm going to do it from back here. What does that mean? That means I'm going to go to church, I'm going to check the box off, but for all my friends and my other relatives and my other people that I like to hang out with on the weekends, they're not going to know about it. I'm going to try to cover it up. See, Peter's following from a distance. We already see how this is going to go. Peter's following from a distance. He's not right up next to Jesus anymore. You know, two hours ago, three hours ago, he told Jesus he was going to die for him. Now he's walking at a distance behind him. You know, sometimes when we think something's going to go a certain way and it doesn't, we automatically start to back away from our Savior. But in reality, our Savior says that that's the moment you need to lean in. Because if you're confused, that's good because I'm not. It's often when we think that we got it right that we're actually the most confused. But in the times of confusion for us, God, I just just don't know. I just don't see it. God, I just don't understand. I thought that I was going to chop the ear off and we were going to start the the rebellion right there and we were going to win. And he's following from a distance just contemplating, man, is this guy, like, he is the Messiah, but why isn't he taking over? See, we do that a lot in our life. Well, he is God, but why is it happening this way? Why is it taking place this way? We start getting confused and we're like, and really what it is, is all of a sudden we're out of control. And let me tell you something, when you're not in control, that's a good thing because that means God is. See, Peter was not in control anymore. He knew what it was supposed to be like. He thought he did. He had it figured out. Now they find themselves in the courtyard and Peter's sitting there and he finds himself sitting among people that are not like him. He's sitting among these servants and these leaders in the temple guard, even some of the priests that would have possibly been in there, some of the soldiers that would have been in there. And Peter's sitting at a distance and the Bible says that he finds himself sitting or standing around a fire with these people. And in this moment, while he's standing around the fire, people start to recognize him. They say, hey, aren't you you one of those followers? And he's, no, 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 not me, not me. I say, okay, okay. Goes to another place, and all of a sudden the Bible says that somebody's looking intently at him. They're, They're looking at, they're like, hold on. Nah. Now, you're one of them followers. He's like, man, I don't know what you're talking about. It's not me. I'm not one of them. Then all of a sudden, it starts kind of going around. Servants are going to other places. They're pointing at people. They're like, hey, yo, yo, you see him? Yeah, yeah, I see him. Yeah, that's that's one. I saw him there. I saw him in the garden. That's got to be one of the followers. That's got to be. And Peter says, no, I don't even know him. Then the rooster crows. And in that moment, the Bible says that Peter looks up and he makes eye contact with Jesus. And the memories of what Jesus said rush into him. You said you were ready to die. I'm telling you, you're ready to deny. You think you're ready to die, but you're going to deny. Peter all of a sudden is being humbled in that moment. The Bible says that after this, when he realizes what he's done, he's not this bold, impulsive Peter. He's not this one that's taking the lead, taking the charge anymore. We see him sitting among people that he should not be sitting with, and he's denying who he is. Can I tell you something? You will always deny who you are when you try to sit with those that you are not. Did you hear that? You will always try to deny who you are when you find yourself trying to sit with those that you are not. And that's what Peter was doing. Sitting with those whom he wasn't, trying to deny who he really was. I don't know if you've ever been in that stage, but I know I have. When I first came to Christ, there were times that I would try to live in two worlds. I was a Christian now, but I still like to party. I'm a Christian now, but you know what? Premarital sex, eh. God's not going to kill me for that. 
And it's like, you're right, God won't kill you, but the Bible says this, for the wages of sin is death. You're killing yourself. We live in these two different worlds. We see the same thing. What Peter's trying to do is operate in two different places at once. But let me tell you something. Someone looked at Peter intently across the way and they said, surely he was with him. Can I tell you something? If you spent the limited amount of time with Jesus and been changed by him, you cannot hide from him. People will recognize you. If you are a follower of Jesus, people will recognize you no matter where you are. And they even said it, you're a Galilean, your speech gives it away. You know, when you're a Jesus follower, your speech is going to give it away. If you're really a follower of Jesus, it's going to give it away. When I'm anywhere I'm at, when I'm talking, I can't help but mention the name of Jesus. I can't help but just say things about Jesus. I can't help but say, oh, I go to church or oh, this or oh, that, because that's my life. My speech backs it up. I can't hide from it. I can go sit in the club all night long and I can try to blend in. But guess what? When you see me sitting here like this, looking at everybody like, oh my God, what's going on? Uh, You can tell I'm not supposed to be there. Too often Christians try to fit in with those they're not. And by doing so, they deny whose they are. And see, Peter's in that same place, but I asked myself this question, okay, if Peter's here, then what happened? Why did this have to happen? Because here's what I know, Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny him. Why did Jesus not sit Peter down and say, yo, let me tell you something, here's what's going to happen, they're going to arrest me. We're going to get in the garden. You're going to want to chop a guy's ears off. Don't do it. I'm going to have to fix it. It's going to look real bad on you, okay? Let's just keep going, right? Then he could get to the other part and say, look, some people are going to ask you, do you know me? And they're going to, you're going to want to be like, no, nah, I don't know him. No, nah, I don't know him. Let me tell you, the answer is yes, you know me. Jesus could do that. But he didn't. Many would say, well, he warned him. He didn't warn him. He told him. He didn't say, hey, you're going to deny me three times. I hope you don't. Let me show you a way out of it. No, he told them this is what's going to happen. Get ready for it. I'm often, when I think about this story, I think about my life when I was in a car accident at 17 years old and a friend of mine got killed. We flipped three and a half times. She was driving. She was ejected, hit a tree, died on impact. Now, here's the interesting thing about that story. The night before, I dreamt that story. I had a dream that I was in a car wreck. The girl I was with died in the dream. We started flipping. I woke up that morning. I go to my mom. I tell my mom, I said, mom, I had a really bad dream last night. I used to think my mom was crazy. Sorry, mom, if you ever watch this, you're not. I used to think she was crazy because she always had dreams. And now that I know the Bible and it says that people will have dreams in those days, I'm like, ah. So my mom always had these dreams. So I go to her and said, Mom, I had this bad dream. I was in a wreck last night. The girl I was riding with, she got killed. We, fl- we started flipping. I woke up. Mom says, don't worry about it. Go to school. It's all good. Less than 24 hours later, I'm in a car. We're driving. We start to flip. The same exact thing that happened in my dream. I told my mother, I remember spiraling downward in a dream and I woke up. All of a sudden, I remember in this wreck, the last thing before I blacked out was I spiraled downward and I blacked out. You know what? It wasn't God warning me this is about to happen. Don't do it. This was God telling me I've been trying to get your attention and this is the only thing that's happening next. Then people say, well, why did she have to die? Here's my only answer. She was a Christian. I was not. She was ready for heaven. I would have been in hell. We see this happening, Jesus is not warning Peter as if he was to stop him. He's warning him as if he was to prepare him because this preparation was part of his process. So now we find himself, he's sitting there. He denies three times and he runs out and he's crying. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for Peter? Well, as I think about this story, I want us to look at three things. And the first thing I want us to see is that Peter had to be humbled to be helpful. Peter had to be humbled to be helpful. If you read the Bible at any extent, Peter was so impulsive 
This man was ready to chop ears off. This man was ready to build tents when he saw the image of Moses and Elijah come down on the mountain. He's like, Lord, it's good for me to be here. Let's make some tents. And Jesus is like, they're not staying, dude. <laughs> you missed it. You know, some of us in ministry, man, we're super impulsive. I, I, I've been this way. I'm still this way a little bit. But when I was younger, man, it was worse. It's like, just send me out into the field, God. I'm ready to take it on. And he says, your heart is willing, but your flesh is super weak right now, son. And if I send you out into the field without the process, the pain that comes with it will overtake you, it will overcome you, and you will no longer be where I have called you. It's part of the process. So he says, Peter needs to be humbled. How does Peter get humbled? Well, Peter's like, Lord, I'm not ever going to leave you. <laughs> Jesus is like, watch. You ever made a statement like that? I have. I made a lot. I'm like, I ain't never doing this. Then I do. <laughs> and then it's like, all right, well, I won't do that, though. And then I do. <laughs> you know, sometimes God's got to humble all of us. When we think we've got control of it, we think we know what's next, we think God, you mean, imagine Peter. He's practically leading Jesus when Jesus should be leading Peter. He's like, no, Lord, you don't need to go to the cross. No, Lord, I'll protect you. No, Lord, I'll, I'll die for you. Jesus is like, the problem is I'm supposed to die for you. Peter's skipping the process. Jesus says, it's no good if you die. It's only good if I die. Sometimes we hinder what God is supposed to do because it doesn't line up with what we think he should do. Peter's literally trying to stop the one thing that saved all of us and himself included, the death of Jesus. He says, you're skipping the process. He had to be humbled. The next thing I want you to see is he wasn't just, he didn't have to be humble, but he had to lose his identity to learn it. Peter had to lose his identity to learn it. You know, when I came to Christ, I had an identity that I had built up. I was a football player. I was a popular kid in my high school. I was a starting quarterback. I had all these things that were, that, that were about me. And then when it came into ministry world, like I was a good communicator. I could get people to follow me. I could uh, rally the troops. Uh, you know, I, I was nice to an extent. Some people were like, no, he's not. But whatever, That's, you keep your mouth shut. But I had all these things, and I'm like, Lord, I'm ready. Lord, I'm ready. Lord, I'm ready. I can do this. I can preach for you. I can teach for you. I can go. I'm, I'm not afraid to go to the nations. I'm not afraid to live in Africa in a tent for 32 days with no. I'll do it. And then you know what the Lord said? There's a lot of issues with what you just told me, John Michael. Sounds good. But everything that you said is I. God, I can speak. God, I can get people to follow me. God, I'm not afraid to take off to another third world country. And he's like, yeah, but for whose honor and whose glory? See, there's a process. And as much as I wanted to take off and just do it, God says, everything I hear about you is I, 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 I. And what he was telling me is you have an identity crisis. You know, Peter had an identity crisis. He knew he was bold. That's good. But boldness in the wrong times can be very bad. You know, with boldness, you need wisdom. Peter was super impulsive. You know, great leaders, they make quick decisions on the fly. But they don't make impulsive decisions based off of pressure. See, Peter, he had a lot of things about him that were good, but it was still about him. So imagine Peter being stuck in this place next to a fire pit, next to all these people, and the identity of Peter is being stripped away every single time the question is asked, do you know him? Peter outside of the garden would have been like, yeah, I know him. Are you a follower? Yeah, I'm a follower. You're one of his? Heck yes, I'm one of his. 
But now all of a sudden, because Jesus is not operating in the realm that Peter thought he was, Peter thought it was going to stop in the garden. Now he's found himself in the palace inside the middle of, of the courtyard and he doesn't know what to do. So now he's sitting there and he's thinking. And every single time the question is asked, are you following Jesus? No. And you see the boldness gone away. Are you sure you're not a follower of Jesus? No. Impulsive. Gone. Gone. Peter pretended to be a strong man. He would often stand in front of the other disciples and say things like, hey, Jesus, if that's really you, call me out on the water. Looking back at the other guys being like, don't worry, I got this. And then in this moment, he's the one that's sitting back saying, I don't even know who he is. But I want us to recognize something here. Peter's identity had to be broken. His identity had to be stripped away. It had to be less about him and more about the mission of God. And the mission of God, even though Peter didn't understand it at the time, was to die, to be buried, to resurrect, to go to the Father, and to come back. Peter didn't get it. And so at the time, it was all about Peter when it should have been all about God. You know, sometimes God will put calamity in your life just to readjust you a little bit to let you know, hey, I need, you to, I need to remind you of something. It's not about you. I put this in your life to remind you that it's not about you. And I've also put this in your life to recognize that you can't do this alone. You know what Peter was ready to do? He was ready to go die alone with Jesus. He says, I don't care what they do. I'm going alone. Jesus says, you can't do it alone. He had to strip him of his identity. Some of us in here today, we feel that way. We're like, God, why is this happening? He says, because I got to strip you of your identity. I got to strip you of what you've built up. I got to strip you of what you think about yourself. And I need you to start learning who you really are in me. I need you to start learning who you really are in Christ, adopting me as your identity. Then Peter, the last thing we see is, not only did Peter have to be humbled to be helpful, he needed to be humble. We can't be helpful in the ministry if we're too prideful. He says that Peter also had to lose his identity to learn it. And the last thing we have to see is that Peter had to be broken to be built. Peter had to be broken to be built. You know, many times in my life I think about this and, and I think about what it means to be broken and why God has to break us. See, oftentimes we want to take the wheel in life. And really what I feel like God does in my life is God likes to break my wrist sometimes. <laughs> I'm holding on to the wheel. I got everything in control. I'm like, God, I got this. We're good. How's the church going down there? I got it. How's the soundboard going? I got it. <laughs> ah. And I'm over here just, oh, I'm driving, man. I'm like, <clears throat> Good God, but I'm, I'm keeping it on the road. Don't worry. And then he breaks my wrist. And why does he do that? Because now the one thing that I want in my life is control. So he breaks the one thing that I have that can have me control. He breaks that area. I don't know what it is for you. It might not be control in your life. It might be something totally different. But he's going to break the one thing that's holding on to that area. Because if he doesn't break it, he can't rebuild it into what it needs to be. And see, Peter needed to be broken so that he could be built. Peter needed to be broken down. He needed to recognize you're not what you think you are apart from me. With me, you can be all those things, Peter. But without me, you're nothing. You know, we've all been in that place where we have to be broken. Where all of a sudden, God, he wants to break us so that he can build us. You know, I mentioned earlier that when God first called me into ministry, I was feeling this, this burden on my life to, to do something in ministry. I didn't know I was gonna be a pastor. I had no idea what I was gonna do. But there was a burden there. And I was like, God, just send me out. 
I remember being in college, learning and being like, why do I have to study it? Let me go do it. And I wish I could say that once I entered into the call of ministry that everything was just (laughs) hunky-dory. It's just great. But the moment that I answered the call into ministry, what I failed to realize is I entered into the process of a promise that God had for me. Saying that if you follow my ways, if you obey me, if you do what I command, here's what I'm showing you, John Michael. I'm showing you that you have potential to reach hundreds, thousands of people for my name, not for your name. If you'll just follow me and do what I tell you to do. Yes, you have potential, John Michael, but it's not about you. It can't be about you. It's got to always be about me. And now here we are. And there were times in my life that God had to break me. He had to break me. He had to break me of my pride. He had to break me of my addictions. He had to break me of my lust. He had to break me of patterns that were endless cycles in my life. God is still breaking me constantly. It's not over. It's a lifetime of God breaking us and building us, breaking us and building us. But let me leave you with one thing. This is what I hold on to. I hold on to something that Peter forgot about. Peter was in a process and Peter experienced a lot of pain, but there's something that Peter forgot about. Early on in Matthew chapter six, I believe it's Matthew chapter six. Jesus looks at Peter and he says these words. Your name is Cephas. I call you Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Then in the upper room, Jesus looks at Peter and he says, Peter, the devil has asked to sift you. And he says, but I prayed for you. What Jesus is saying is the devil wanted you, but I've been protecting you, son. Because there's a promise attached to you. Then when Peter's in the garden and all this is going on and all of a sudden everything, all hell's breaking loose, he's denied everything. All of a sudden he recognized he let Jesus down. He starts crying. He runs out and he weeps. He's repenting. He's so sad. He's so sorry. But you know what? For Jesus, he's saying, Peter, I gave you the promise before I ever, before I ever led you into the problems. I knew what you would do. I knew how you would turn out. I knew how you would act. But yet I told you on this rock, I will build my church. Peter, I'm not forsaking you. Peter, I'm not abandoning you. Peter, you can't out my love. And you know, in my life, there have been moments where all of a sudden I find myself addicted to something that I shouldn't be addicted to. And I feel like, Peter, I want to go run outside of the temple and cry and just go back to fishing and go back to my old ways, back to my old life. I say, God, I just can't do this anymore. There's times in my life that I've gone through a divorce where I say, God, I'm unqualified. I must not be able to preach anymore. I must not be able to do this anymore. And then God reminds me, he said, I called you to ministry before I ever called you to marriage. I knew the problem you would have, but I gave you a promise anyway. Let me tell you something, church. Some of you got a promise from God that you need to stand on. You need to claim it. You need to be there. And when all hell breaks loose, you look back and you say, no, I have a promise. I have a promise. He said, I am a son. I am a daughter. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
See, Peter, in this moment, he was in the process and he forgot the promise. But the good news is Jesus comes back around in John 21. I'm going to keep saying this. Be here in four weeks because we're talking about John 21. He brings it back around and he brings it all together. And he shows Peter how the promise, it still stands. Can I tell you something, church? It doesn't matter how far you've run. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, how far you've gone. If you come back to the Lord and you repent before a holy God saying, I messed up. I'm not good enough to do what I'm doing. I'm not by, I, I'm not worthy. He'll say, you're right, but I'm worthy. I'll make you worthy. I'll call you back into the fold. I'll give you right back in. I'll keep you going. You don't have to worry about it. He says, if you'll just come to me and repent. Some of us in this room, that's what we need to do. You've been feeling broken. You feel like your identity shifted. You feel like you've been getting humbled. You don't understand why. You don't understand what's going on. But in the loving eyes of our Father, even as He's going to the cross, getting beaten, He has a moment where He says, I'm not done with Peter yet. There's still some things that need to change before I go to the cross. You know what that tells me? Our Father, He always is focused on you. He's always focused on you. His eyes are on you. Not to hurt you, to curse you, to throw you out, but to say, I love you, come back. Maybe that's you today and you're in here and you say, man, I feel like I, I've been being humbled. My identity's getting gone. I feel broken. You know what you need to do? You need to be down here at this altar during prayer time. You need to be down here saying, God, thank you for humbling me because I recognize you're making me helpful for the future. God, thank you for stripping my identity away. Thank you for removing the people in my life, in my circle, that I keep trying to deny whose I am because of who I'm around. God, thank you for that. God, thank you for breaking me down so that I'll stop trying to hold on and I'll just let you have it. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's your prayer today. You need to be at this altar just giving it to God, saying, God, I, I see you, but I know you're not done with me. Maybe you're in here, though, and you say, man, I want a relationship with God. I've never had that relationship. Today's your day. You can pray this prayer right here. You can say, Father God, I, I'm a sinner. Father, would you forgive me of my sin? From this day forward, I want to follow you. If you believe it in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. Church, I want to invite us to stand up all around. If you're in here today and that's you and you say, hey, I prayed that prayer or I want to pray that prayer or I want to pray with somebody, I want to talk to somebody about receiving Jesus or I want to talk to somebody about getting baptized because I've already received Jesus, I want you to make your way to the back. There's going to be some people back there, myself included, ready to go. I'll be ready to receive you and pray with you. Maybe it's somebody else and you're in here and you say, hey, I need prayer. I just want to come down here and just give it to the Lord. This altar's open. Don't wait on your neighbor. Don't wait on anybody else. Come on down here. Father God, I thank you so much for what you've done in this place today.